Okay, good evening, or afternoon. It's time for us to uh, begin our 2 o'clock uh, lecture. I apologize for starting a few minutes late uh, as we were trying to get some things uh, improved for our technology. Uh, our speaker for this afternoon is Dr. Kirk Brothers. He's the president of Heritage Christian uh, University in Florence, Alabama. He previously worked as a professor for Fried Hardeman University for eight years. He serves as a part-time missionary in Latin America under the eldership of the Forest Park Church in Valdosta, Georgia. This work includes starting future ministers training camps for young men ages 12 to 14, as well as serving as an adjunct professor and as the director of academics for the Bible School of the Americas in Panama. He has been married to his wife, Cindy, for 35 years, and together they have two daughters, Katie and Hannah. They are the members of the Killen Church of Christ in Killen, Alabama, uh, where he frequently fills in as a teacher, preacher, and song leader. Uh, this afternoon, he will be speaking to us on the subject of intercessory prayer, and we will allow him to do that after Matthew Crabtree leads us in prayer. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day, and just thank you for this opportunity for all of us to be able to come here and to learn more about your word and learn more about the book of Job. Help us have our hearts and mind open to what uh, Mr. Kirk Brothers has to say and just be with him as he gives us this lesson. Help us uh, help him be a, uh, an instrument of your word, Lord. And we ask you all these things in your son's name we pray. Amen. We all have our storms. Sometimes they involve wind and rain. Sometimes they involve heartache and loss and fear and terror in other ways. So I want you to think about some of the life storms that you've dealt with. It was 1992, my wife Cindy and I had been married about four years. And we were about to have our first child. We were about 10 days prior to the due date, had just that afternoon she had been to the doctor. Doc said everything's fine. In fact, one of the last things he said before he walked out of the room was, you know, the first one is always late. Well, I assume doctors, you know, had it all figured out, so I did what every good husband would do. I went to the regional championship football game that night. It was only, actually, literally as a crow flies, about a mile from my house. And I can vividly remember when the game was over, which we won, by the way. I walked down to my parents' house. They lived about five houses from the football field. And I remember opening the front door, and when I came through the door, my younger, bigger brother, I've got a brother nine years younger than me, who is literally a foot taller than me. And he came to the bottom of the steps and he said, Cindy's at the hospital and you need to go. And so I remember going to the hospital. It turns out I was only about 15 minutes behind her. But I knew it was serious because when I got to the emergency room, they had already moved her upstairs. They just bypassed emergency and went straight on. And I remember when I got into there where the room she was and they got her hooked up already to a lot of things or working on connecting some other stuff and they're starting to look and see what's going on and they're saying pretty quickly after that says, you know, Katie, we'd, we'd already named her, she, she's breech. And so we're going to have to do emergency surgery. And then I remember them saying, well, there's another lady that's had a worse emergency so they gave Cindy, though, that medicine they give you to stop your contractions or slow them down so they could fix the other emergency, so they could fix Cindy and Katie's emergency. And I remember finally when they wheeled Cindy down the hall, and there was a moment they, they take her into the surgery where they're going to do a C-section, and I'm going to follow along, but for a moment it's just me in the room, and the only light is that little strip of light that's right above the bed, not the main light in the middle of the room, but the one that's just above the bed that the nurse turns on at night when you're sleeping, but she or he needs to keep from bumping into things. 
And I remember falling to my knees and weeping and saying, God, please take care of my wife. Because nothing they taught us in the Lamaze class was anything like what was happening. And I can remember when Katie was brought into the world. She failed three of her first five APGAR tests. I remember she was blue. In fact, to this day, I tell her, I didn't have a child, I had a Smurf. <laughs> Katie has cerebral palsy because of oxygen deprivation. She has a genetic disorder called Turner Syndrome. She's 30 years old now, and she lives with us, and she's doing well, but she'll always live with us. She'll always be special needs. There's always special things that she'll have to deal with in life. But for me, as a young youth minister, thinking, okay, I'm serving God, I'm trying to live my life leading young people to God, I'm, I'm married to a beautiful, amazing, godly Christian woman, we're going to have a child, and everything is following the script. And then the sky grew dark, and the winds circled, and everything changed. And everything that I thought was up became down, right became left, and true became false. And I had to decide what I believe in. What I'd like each of you to do is just insert your storm. Everybody in this room probably has not just one, but many. Maybe it's a diagnosis. Maybe it's a day that you stood by a graveside. Maybe it's some financial crisis you went through. Maybe it was losing a job or a home. But insert your storm. As we address what we've been asked to look at for the next few moments, Job's intercessory prayer for his friends. Mr. President, it's sure nice to be on your campus. We get to see each other, I guess about once a year, all of us get together and we kind of rotate campuses and it'll be a while, I think, before they get to our campuses. So I'm glad I got to be here today and got to spend some time with you. Uh, we've eaten several meals together, I guess, at uh, the President's get-togethers. I'm excited about being here. I enjoyed so much getting to hear my friend Ryan. When I left Freed Hardman, he took over some of the work that I was doing there as a professor and I enjoyed getting to eat lunch with Dale Jenkins, a good friend of mine and one of our board members at Heritage, as well as the Andersons. I enjoyed so much hearing Jim Martin just a moment ago. And I appreciate y'all having Heritage Day because you've got a Heritage board member here and I'm here. And then Jim went to school. At it, so that was really kind of y'all for doing that. I appreciate Caleb. Uh, first, of all, first of all, I appreciate Jeremy's kind introduction. I, I've known a bunch of the Pierces, when I, especially when my time when I was at Freed Hardeman. And I won't hold any of them against you, at least your brother. Uh, but... Uh, he comes, as my daddy used to say, from good stock. People who are about mission and about God's kingdom. I appreciate all the work Caleb did in getting things coordinated. Uh, he and his two sisters had to put up with me as teachers uh, at, when I was at Freed Hardman. And I don't think I put them to sleep too many times. Uh, he was talking about he would come to class every day in prison epistles. On one side, he'd have a coffee mug. On the other, he'd have a thing of water. Those were his two six guns to get ready for my class. Job's intercessory prayer. I'd like us to begin by reading the passage that's been assigned to us. So if you've got your Bibles, would you please open them to Job chapter 42. Job 42 and verse 7. And it came about after the Lord had spoken these words to Job that the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite... My wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends because you have not spoken of me what, as, is, what is right as my servant Job has. Now therefore, take for yourselves seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up a burnt offering for yourselves and my servant Job will pray for you. For I will accept him, so that I may not do with you according to your folly, because you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuite 
And Zophar the Naamathite went and did as the Lord told them, and the Lord accepted Job. Now, as we think about what's going on in this particular passage, what I'd like to do is first go backward before we go forward. In a lot of passages, and I think especially here, it's important that we get the context before we dive into the text. And as I go through this, I don't want to insult your intelligence. I know that other speakers have talked about some of these things. I know that many of you have studied Job before. But it's really important because much of what he's doing here, God is doing here with Job and Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar, ties back to what's been happening in the first 41 chapters. So I want us to kind of back up a little bit. The theme verse is found in chapter 1. You've really got two key verses where God says, Behold my servant Job. Have you seen my servant Job? So God brags on Job. And I've often thought, could God brag on me? But the key theme of the book is the question that is asked by literally the adversary, the accuser. Does Job fear God for no reason? Maybe your translation says, does Job serve God for nothing? So God brags on Job, says he's blameless and upright. It's important. The writer of the book of Job allows us to see behind the curtain. And we know some things that the actors in the play do not know. The people living out the story. We know the back story. And one of the things God does initially is he establishes Job is blameless. There's no room for argument. God establishes it before anything else happens. But then immediately the accuser questions it. Does Job serve you for nothing? In other words, doesn't he really just serve you because you give him stuff? And doesn't he really just serve you because you keep him safe and don't let bad things happen to him? And so what's happening in chapter 1 and chapter 2 is really the beginning of the journey of of learning whether or not Job serves God for something. Stuff or safety. In other words, it is an attack on the integrity of man and the sovereignty and the lovability of God. He only serves you because you give him stuff. You've bought his allegiance. You've kept him safe. If his stuff and his safety changes, his allegiance will change. And so God allows him to mess with his stuff. And then God gives him the freedom to mess with his safety. And so Job finds himself on a pile of ash using broken pieces of pottery to scrape the open sores that are on his body. So the whole book, everything that happens, is answering the question, why does Job serve God? Does he serve because God bought his allegiance? Now, there's an outline that I use that's on the screen. You may have another outline that works for you. But if we're going to look at what is happening in chapter 42, the section we've been assigned in verses 7 through 10 focuses on Job, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. So we need to know their relationship up to this point. We need to know the backstory. Now initially they come and they weep. I appreciate Jim talking about uh, his friend who had lost his child at Vietnam and the, the fishing buddy who just said, I'm here to mourn with you and just stood by him. For seven days, that's what the friends did. They just knelt and wept and prayed and mourned with him. But then the speeches are going to start. The whole book, as you've talked about in other lessons, is built around payback theory. The big word used sometimes is retribution theory. And this is really important to what's happening in verses 7 through 10 of chapter 42. 
It's built on the idea you do good, you get good, you do bad, you get bad. Most of the ancient world, it doesn't matter whether they were Jews believing in the one true God or pagan idol worshipers, most in the ancient world, Old Testament and New Testament, believed in retribution theory. Even the apostles believed in it. In John chapter 9, they see a blind man, and the apostles ask Jesus, Who sinned? That's just how they operated. They assumed if you get good, you did good. If you get bad, you did bad. And it's summed up in this statement in chapter 4 where Eliphaz basically says, from my experience, it's been that those who sow trouble harvest it. So if you harvest bad stuff, it's because you sold bad stuff. You did bad stuff. And that's the, at the heart of the, the speeches, the cycle of speeches between Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, and Job. And as we work through those speeches, their speeches are going to get shorter and harsher, and Job's speeches are going to get longer, and as he moves further into the speeches, he just ignores his friends for the most part because they're not listening to him, and so he actually increasingly stops talking to his friends, and he starts addressing God. And especially asking, oh, if just somebody would listen to me. And as we go through the speeches, a key takeaway, first of all, is that they are lousy comforters. And so he talks about that in chapter 16 and in chapter 21 and hints at it throughout the book. Lousy comforters are you all. Miserable is what the New American Standard uses there. Let me give you a couple of examples. Job has just lost ten children. I remember... Vividly wondering, is my first child going to live? She has a genetic disorder in which 99% of them do not live to birth. She's a one percenter. I cannot imagine if she had been in the 99%. I cannot fathom what it would be like to lose one child. Job lost ten. And yet these friends who arrived to mourn with him said, you know your kids died because they're sinners, right? Your kids are dead because they were wicked. I mean, you talk about, this is not just salt in a wound. This is taking a saw to an open wound. They then go on to say of him, that you have great wickedness. You can see here in chapter 22 and verse 5. Is not your wickedness great and your iniquities without end? They said, Job, this happened because you're wicked. And what's interesting in chapter 22 is that he not only says that Job is wicked, he then starts listing things Job did. Which is really interesting because we already know from chapter 1 he's blameless. He didn't do these things. He's making stuff up. So they called him a sinner, made up lies against him. Why? Because it messed with their worldview. When we're presented with new information, we've got a choice. We either adjust what we thought we previously knew or we adjust the new information and force it to fit what we used to know. And what they did is instead of accepting, they, they could understand a word. If bad stuff happened, I did something bad, I can handle that world. If I do something good and I get something good, I can live with that world. But a world in which good people can have bad things happen to them, I can't handle that kind of world. And so they refused to accept the possibility that Job could actually not be responsible for the bad stuff happened to him. And so this is their response to attack Job, and to attack his family. Chapter 5, verse 1 is really important in this discussion. It's important in light of chapter 42, verses 7 through 10. Because one of the things Eliphaz says in his very first speech is, who are you going to call on? Who's going to listen to you? Which of the holy ones can you turn to? You're a sinner, Job. No one in heaven is listening. God's not going to listen to a sinner like you. Unless you repent and make it right, you do not have an advocate in heaven. That is huge to remember for what happens in 
chapter 38 through 42. You're going to have a little poem, an ode to wisdom thrown in there. And then Job's going to give his oath of innocence. And in that, we learn two things. We learn, number one, how badly he's hurting. And number two, he sticks with his blamelessness. He is convinced. He's not saying he's a perfect person. He's just saying, I haven't done anything to deserve what's happened to me. I don't believe my actions are responsible for what's going on in my life. And as you feel his pain, he says, I remember when. Oh, if I could only go back in time to when people listened to me and respected me. If I could only go back to when, when God treasured our relationship. And I wonder if his voice broke as he said, if I could only have my children around me. Have you been there? You wish you could go back before the diagnosis? You could go back before the open grave? Back before the divorce? Whatever the storm was in your life, he is longing for the day before his world fell apart when his children gathered around him. He also talks about that he has not committed this sin. He didn't lose his rich blessings from God. He didn't lose his righteousness because now everybody thought he was a sinner. He does not believe that he lost the reliance people used to, to put in him. People used to count on him. They used to respect him. He used to rejoice in his family and his friends and his life. He does not believe that he lost all of that because of his sin. And he said, if only, if only someone would listen. Have you ever been in a point in your life you were hurting so bad and you were so low that you felt like there was nobody listening? That your prayers didn't get any higher than the ceiling? That heaven had closed its doors? You know, there's some times in life when God feels like he's right there. But then there's some times in life it feels like he's a million miles away. The storm gets in between us and God and that's what it feels like. And so Job says, oh, oh, if just somebody would listen to me. He signs his oath of innocence and says, if I could just stand in the presence of my accuser. We have the Elihu speeches in between. But then suddenly the sky grows dark and the wind begins to swirl. We've all been reminded across the South, including right here in Arkansas lately, of the power of a tornado. We felt it where I used to live in Amory, Mississippi. You felt them here in Arkansas. We had an F2 go through Florence and the Killen area. Twice in my life I've been at the site of a tornado. Once on our home back in 74 in Kentucky and another time on the church building in Elizabethtown, Kentucky. I can vividly remember when I was a kid, the house shaking, the whole three-story house shaking. I can remember the sound of hail that later when I picked it up was the size of a women's softball slamming into our home. I can remember standing in the hallway years later at the Elizabethtown Church of Christ, and I can remember we were all gathered in the teacher's craft room. There were about eight of us in the building standing in that room and they were talking and we're looking out the window and there's this greenish black swirl as the wind is rattling and there was a lady standing there who had moved to Kentucky from Oklahoma and she absent-mindedly says, you know, if I was in Oklahoma, I would say that's a tornado. Well, duh. And we all look at each other, and we ran out into the hallway, and I had to travel to about 10 feet when the roof disappeared over our heads. 
Can you imagine Job standing in the midst of a tornado? Job in the midst of a whirlwind. Job in the midst of a hurricane. As he has been crying out for God to answer him, God has arrived. I think about God coming down on Mount Sinai and his presence was so powerful, the mountain exploded. And the book of Deuteronomy says the people went to Moses and said, please go talk to God. If he says one more word, we're going to die. We can't even handle the sound of his voice. And so God comes in the storm even as Job was already in a storm. He says, where were you when I made the world? What is it that I know that you also know? That brings us then to the conclusion of it all. The aftermath of the coming of two storms. The storms of struggle and the storm of the presence of God. In chapter 42, in the aftermath of the storm, Job relents. He lays down his case. He's been making accusations. He's, he's asked for a court date. He relents. He lays down the affidavit. He lays down the indictment and says, I repent. Now, he's not repenting of anything he did to cause his pain. He's repenting of how he responded to it. Because he's already acknowledged that he spoke about things he did not understand, that he had had pride, that he had thought he knew more than God, that, that he had brought God down, that he might lift himself up. So he's... He's not saying he did anything to cause this to happen, but he acknowledges that in his pain and response to God, he did not respond in a godly way. And so he repents. And it's interesting that he says, I repent in sackcloth and ashes. You, you've got a number of full circle moments happening in chapter 42. Do you remember where he was after Satan was done with him in Job chapter 2? He was sitting on a pile of ash, scraping himself with broken pottery. You come to chapter 42, and what does he say? I replant in sackcloth and ashes. Now we're ready for our verses. So let's take a moment and see what God is doing here. Now, it says that he immediately addresses Eliphaz. Eliphaz was likely the oldest. He begins all the cycle of speeches. And so as a sign of respect, he went first, and God addressed him first. And he says directly to Eliphaz that his anger burns against him. Now, don't you realize, the storm's still there. I can't tell that there's a break in the sequence of events. God comes in the storm, and you have this dialogue back and forth between God and Job, and then God turns from Job to Eliphaz. And I cannot help but wonder, you know, how much of that conversation, I'm assuming all of the conversation between God and Job in chapters 38 through 41, is he there for? So he's in the presence of God, and, and I, can't, I can't but wonder if Eliphaz and the two friends were like, ha, 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 we've been trying to tell you. And so when God comes and says, who is this that darkens my counsel without wisdom? Who is this that's talking about stuff that they don't know anything about? I can just all the way almost imagine the three friends, oh, okay, here's his upcomings. We tried to tell him if he'd only listened to us, But then God turns to them. And in life it's real easy to point a finger at somebody else and to forget that God just might be upset with us instead of the person that we're pointing fingers at. So God is angry with him because he and his friends have not spoken right about God. We'll come back to that in a moment. 
But the key part of it is not just that he is angry with Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, but that he immediately connects their change to Job. He contrasts them to Job. You have not spoken right like Job. And to make things right, he doesn't say Job's going to come to you. You go to Job. You put forth the effort. And he says, Job is going to pray for you, and I am going to listen to Job. So I want you to notice this emphasis on not only their sin, but the rightness of Job. He's the one you're going to go to. He's the one that is going to pray for you. And again, think about this full circle moment. How does the book begin? Think about what was referred to in Ryan's lesson. The book begins with Job interceding for somebody. It begins with him interceding for his children. Just by chance, just in case when they threw a party they did something wrong, he offered sacrifices for them. He just wanted to make sure his kids were right with God. And so the book begins with him interceding for somebody, and the book ends with him interceding for somebody. It seems it's just a part of his DNA to kind of serve that priest role to be a mediator, a go-between, between people and God. I think of other folks that are just like that. Moses is very much like that. I think about Numbers chapter 14, where you're in the aftermath of the, the episode of the 12 spies, where the 10 said, we can't do this, they are like giants and we're so small. The two said, no, God can do this. And the people listened to the ten instead of the two and were about to replace Moses and Aaron and stone the two. God, in his righteous indignation, is ready to wipe out this nation and start all over with Moses. But Moses intercedes for the people. What would the nation say? What will the Egyptians say? It's fascinating to think of one small man carrying on such a conversation with the creator of the universe. And so much was this a part of the character of Moses that the people came to recognize his intercessory value. And so you can look in Numbers chapter 21. They go to Moses and ask him to intercede for them. I think of Exodus chapter 33, where Moses would go out to the tent of meeting, the temporary one that he'd set outside the camp. And when he went out there, the people would all watch at the doors of their tents. And when he would get to the tent and the cloud representing the presence of God would come down on the tent, they would rejoice at their tents. Why? Because he's their intercessor. And if, if God's still talking to him, there's still hope for them. And then Jesus, the great intercessor, in whose name we pray, who intercedes for us. I think about John 17 when he spoke to the Father on behalf of his disciples, especially the apostles. Or I think about Luke chapter 23 when he interceded for those who put him on the cross. Father, Forgive them. They don't know what they do. There are some great intercessory prayers in Scripture. And one of those is found here in Job chapter 42. Now what's interesting is, as he says, Job is going to intercede for you. He's going to pray for you. He says, you are wrong because you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. Now we've already acknowledged that Job did some things wrong. He had pride. He spoke without understanding. At times he thought he knew better than God. He is going to justify himself by attacks on God. But God is also reminding them that much of what Job said about God, he had some attitude problems of pride. 
But what he said about God was true. And I want you to wrestle with that. Because part of what he said is, I didn't deserve what happened to me. And one of the, th the mistakes I think we make in studying the book of Job is we try to clean it up and make it neat, and it's messy. And God never intended it for it to be neat. Everywhere you look in the book, God takes full responsibility for what happens to Job. When the first round of horrors had been brought by the adversary on Job, God doesn't say in chapter 2, look at what you did. He says, you have incited me. I did this. Wait well, I mean, I thought the adversary is the one who caused the death of the ten children and the loss of servants and, and the wealth and the pain in his physical body. Well, yes, God gave the freedom to the adversary. God holds himself responsible. God does not run from it or hide from it. The three friends couldn't handle the fact that God might let bad things happen to a good person. And so they thought they had to make themselves the defenders of God. And one of the things God is saying is, I don't need defending. I understand that I am sovereign. And when bad things happen to my people, it's because I allowed it. I'm responsible. He owns it. And far too often as leaders, we don't own our choices. Especially when others don't like it. And so he says, what Job said about me, yes, I did bring this on him. I did allow this to happen. He spoke truth about me. Even though for us as followers, that's tough to wrap our brains around and it gets a little bit messy. He says, my servant Job shall pray for you and I will accept his prayer. And so they did what God told them to do. They offered the sacrifices and God listened to his prayer. By the way, the number of sacrifices is pretty significant. Of course, the number seven would be significant in the Hebrew culture, one of the many numbers for perfection or completion, such as the number 10 and the number 12. But the number implies the sin was significant. God sending a message. But the question that comes into my mind is why? Why does God insist that Job intercede and pray for his friends? Are we required to have someone intercede for us? When we sin against God, do we have to have somebody else? Do we have somebody in some kind of position who speaks on our behalf and God won't forgive us unless they intercede? Well, I can't find biblical evidence of that. I find many places, like even Jesus teaching them to pray in the Sermon on the Mount, where he talks about people going into their closets and praying directly to God and asking for forgiveness. I can't find biblical evidence that requires that when I sin, I have to have somebody intercede for me. So I'll go back to my question. Why here does God require Job? He says, if Job prays for you, I will listen to Job and I will forgive you. Why does God require it to happen that way? Why doesn't he just say, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, get on your knees and start repenting and I'll forgive you? Why does he go through Job? And I don't know that I have all the answers, but let me throw out three possibilities. The first possibility for me is relationship. I'm reminded in Scripture that God doesn't listen to everybody. And there are times when even when dealing with his people, there are times when he says he stops listening to their prayers. You've got Isaiah chapter 1, Malachi chapter 2 as a couple of examples here in the Old Testament. Where in Isaiah he says, you've got blood on your hands. I'm not listening to your prayers anymore. You've got blood stains because of how you've treated people. 
In Malachi, the reason he stopped accepting their sacrifices is because how they were treating the wives of their youth. Remember, that's a section where God says, I hate divorce. You're divorcing your wife, so I'm not listening to your prayers and sacrifices anymore. And then I think about 1 Peter chapter 3, where he talks about husbands dealing with their wives in an understanding way, lest your prayers be hindered. That phrase ought to scare every husband in the room. If you disrespect your wife, God is watching. And how you treat your wife has an impact on how God treats us. So there's sometimes God chooses not to listen to the prayers of His people anymore because of their actions. I also combine that with the fact that there are some people in Scripture that just have a unique and special relationship with God. Moses, again, is an example of that. In chapter 33, he says, You have said, I have known you by name. A name in the Hebrew culture represented the person. To know someone by name meant, I, you know my character. You don't know just the handle I go by. You know the innermost me. In fact, what's going on in Exodus chapter 33 is Moses is saying, you know me by name, show me your glory so I can know you by name. But then what he does is he says, based on the fact that you, God, have told me I have found favor in your eyes, and based on the fact that you have said you know me intimately, I have a couple of requests. Number one, can I know you? And number two, will you remember that this is your people? Because earlier in the chapter, God has said to Moses, I promised your forefathers to give them the promised land, and I keep my promises. But I'm not going with you because you're an obstinate people and I might destroy you on the way. In other words, there will no longer be a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And so what Moses does, based on a relationship, he says, in essence, I know you've said you're not going, but as your friend who you speak to face to face, who you said you know by name, based on that relationship, I am asking you to go with us. And God says he will go, to which you have one of the greatest responses in all of Scripture. Well, if you don't go with us, then we don't want to go. We'd rather be out here in the desert with you than to be in the promised land without you. Think about Job's special relationship with God. When, we, when the curtain opens and we first are introduced to Job, what's he doing? He's interceding and offering sacrifices reaching out to God on the behalf of the people that he loves. And God himself says to the adversary, there's no one like him. So to start with, it may be because there's a unique and special relationship sometimes that God has with certain people combined with the fact that sometimes because of people's sins, God stops listening to their prayers. Could that be it? I don't know, maybe. Number two, I think a real possibility here is retribution. I don't, I don't know if you know the whole thing with Angel Reese and Caitlin Clark. You have the recent women's national basketball championship. Most watched women's championship in all history. LSU defeated Iowa. And one of the big things they were talking about at the end of the game is that the MVP of the tournament... The star player for LSU did John Cena's You Can't See Me move and pointed to a finger looking straight at the superstar who set the all-time NCAA women's tournament scoring record during the tournament. She looked at her and pointed to her finger like, I'm getting a ring and you're not. And a lot of folks have been pretty upset about it. Here's the problem. The girl she did it to had already done it to the her girl she defeated earlier in the tournament. She did it to Arkansas, and then she did similar things when they defeated South Carolina. Now, neither one is how I would, have, would like to win. So I'm not condoning either one, but here's my point. 
you get what you give. In other words, what happened in the championship game was based on what was given in the Elite Eight and the Final Four. Now, why do I mention that? That's what's happening here in Job 42, 7 through 10. I want you to think about the connection to what happened previously. Remember the argument of the friends. Remember what Eliphaz says, According to what I've seen, those who plow iniquity and those who sow trouble harvest it. That's their argument. If you sow trouble, you harvest it. Well, guess what? They learned that retribution theory is not always true, but guess what? It is true for them. You said Job and his kids were sinners. Well, guess what? You're actually the sinners. Of all that they did, there's no evidence that they ever tried to intercede for Job. They told Job he should go repent, but they didn't intercede for him. And ironically, now he has to intercede for them. Remember, he cried out and said, oh, that if I could just have an, an advocate. He says, I believe there's an advocate in heaven, but I don't have one on earth is the implication. And then think of that statement from chapter 5 and verse 1. Call out, who's going to answer? To which of the holy ones would you turn? God is not going to listen to you. And so what does God say in response? He's the only one I'm going to listen to. Literally everything that happens here is, looks like, is retribution for things the friends said and did earlier in the story. God seems to be making a point. And then remission. It's interesting that the text goes on to talk about God restoring the fortunes of Job. And again, this is a point we need to be really careful that we don't try to clean up the messiness too much. I don't want us to leave here acting like, well, it's all okay. God gave him 10 kids and gave him a bunch of stuff. Well, guess what? You can give me 50 kids, but I'd still cry myself to sleep over Katie and Hannah. You don't stop missing 10 because you got 10 more. You don't stop missing the servants who were your friends that died in this story because you got more folks who worked for you. Don't make this story neat. It's messy and it's ugly and it's painful. But faith can live in the middle of messy, ugly, and painful, which is the whole point of the book. And so God restored his fortunes. But did you notice when he did it? When did God, you can read the screen as well as I can, when did God restore the fortunes of Job? Was it when he said, I repent in sackcloth and ashes? When did he restore his fortunes? When he prayed and forgave his friends. I think God's trying to send a message to Job. His friends have been brutal and unkind. At the funeral service, they said, your kids are dead because they're a bunch of sinners. Job needed more than forgiveness. He needed to forgive to truly heal. Again, I go back to the model prayer of Jesus. Forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us. When he finally released his anger towards his friends, God released the blessings of heaven. How many blessings have we shut off because of anger and unkindness we have harbored against others? So what does it mean to us? I think, first of all, there's a warning to be careful we will be judged based on our words. Both Job and the three friends in chapters 38 through 42 were held accountable for things they had said earlier in the book. What comes out of my mouth is something I can be judged for. Related to that, comfort. What kind of comforters are we? 
Are we lousy comforters? I want to really emphasize something Jim talked about. One of the most important things we can do when somebody uses a loved one is just be there, meet their physical needs, and be there and pray for them, provide for their spiritual needs. It is not the time to preach a sermon and explain why everything happened because we probably don't know. Are we good comforters? Number three, kindness. Suffering and struggle is not an excuse to be unkind and unforgiving. That's one of the points of 1 Peter. They're going through persecution. One of the things he's saying in the book is they're upset and they're responding in inappropriate ways because they're upset because they're being persecuted for doing what is right. And one of the things Peter says in the book, if you're going to be suffering, you want to suffer for doing what's right. Don't give bullets to the enemy. Don't start treating your spouses. Don't start responding to the government. Don't start responding to your neighbors in inappropriate ways and prove what they were saying about you. And what happens is when we're hurting and we're broken, guess what we do? We take it out on the people closest to us. And I think an underlying message of verses 7 through 10 is that suffering is not an excuse to be unforgiving and bitter and unkind to others. And then community. That the heart of fellowship is sharing life together. And that includes our suffering, and that includes our sin. And that when we're struggling with sin, it provides us an opportunity to intercede for each other and further tighten the bonds of fellowship. So why does Job serve God? He took his stuff and he took his safety and he still served him. And in the end, do you find it interesting that he never told him why it happened? Why why couldn't God tell him why it happened? Because then he would have served God for something. If God says, Job, let me tell you what's going on. You were attacked and I was attacked... There is a cosmic accusation and struggle going on here that will last down through the ages. And thousands of years from now, people will gather in Arkansas and will wrestle with keeping their faith. And they'll be emboldened and they'll be brave and they'll be strong because you were courageous. Because in spite of everything you lost and everything that happened to you, you did not give up your faith. You did not curse me and throw away your belief. that's what's going on here, Job. And then Job says, okay, great, let's do this thing. I'm in, I'm with you. And then if that's what happens, he serves God for something. But if God never tells him, he just says, you don't know what I know, and you can't do what I can do. Just trust me and love me anyway. And if Job loves him, without knowing without his stuff, and without his safety, then God wins the argument and proves that a human being is capable of loving God for nothing more than he is God and their friend. I took the book of Job and it became very meaningful to us. In 1997, I took it as a five-week short course at Fried Hardeman University. The professor who taught the class had once had his father murdered, and I don't know that they ever found who did it. So he knew the book inside and out. That summer, walking through this book, healed me. And from that day to this, the words of chapter 13 and verse 15 have echoed in my heart. Though he slay me, yet I will hope in him. What happened as a result of that class is I decided I will not let the devil have one happy day because of what happened to Katie. In fact, I want to annoy him with it for the rest of my life. My favorite group is a group called Sister Hazel. And they've got a song called Change Your Mind. If you want to be somebody else, else, If you're tired of fighting battles with yourself, if you want to be somebody else, 
change your mind. There will always be storms. The key to keeping faith in the storms is what's going on in my mind and my heart. Focus on God, focus on faith, focus on forgiveness, and let Him take care of the rest. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Kurt. I want to qualify a statement that, that Kurt made about it being Heritage Day. Uh, just so that you're aware, one of our goals for our lectureship committee this year was to intentionally reach out to as many of our sister institutions as possible and so that we could build better relationships with our sister institutions. And so this week we have, I think it's seven institutions from uh, that are associated with the Churches of Christ that we have with us this week for that sole purpose. And so I think it's time that we understand and recognize that we are at a point where we're going to have to start coming together. That community that you talked about at the end, it's time that we quit fighting against each other and start coming together if we really want to beat and defeat Satan who is working against us so strongly. So I appreciate you being here. Uh, tonight you're not going to miss. Um, we will have another Freed Hardeman uh, person coming with us tonight. Uh, Dr. Ralph Gilmore, and he will be talking about the subject matter of sanctification through suffering. And there's no one better qualified, I think, that can address that issue uh, than Dr. Gilmore. And so I hope that you will make plans to come. I also hope that you will invite somebody and bring somebody with you. And so let's try to fill this place up tonight. Uh, remember the books that are for sale. Remember our friends that are in the back and the things that they have to share with you. And at this time, we'll dismiss until 7 o'clock tonight.